Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. There should be a few more people joining in. Um, everybody's screen should be muted, but if not, just make sure that you stay on mute. It'll help cut down on some of the sound background. Um, I wanna welcome everybody to this uh, really cool opportunity that Dr. Bob and I are putting together about how to create a fearless mindset. And we are just blown away with the turnout um, of everyone who is joining us. So clearly there is a need for wanting to learn as we're getting back to golf, how to have a fearless mindset and how to play our best. Um, so we're gonna start off with um, <clears throat> some brief introductions and then I'm gonna share my screen. Um, if you have access to watch the screen, great. If you're driving and listening to this, you'll be able to pick up some good key pieces. I will be recording this session. So if any of you want the recording later on, just feel free to email me and I'll be happy to send it out to you. My name is Dr. Allison Kurt and I'm a clinical psychotherapist in the state of California and I spend my daytime hours teaching at a facility in Simi Valley so I help golfers with their game and then I spend the evening hours helping athletes and performers perform their best whether that's through golf or their particular sport or at work and creating a fearless mindset is one of the avenues that a lot of performers come to me uh, to want to be able to overcome some of the challenges and obstacles in their life. And I'm really happy to join powers with Dr. Bob Winters on the East Coast, and I'll give him a moment to introduce himself. We've been able to do some really cool Instagram live sessions during this quarantine time, and we're really happy to do the Zoom call together. So Dr. Bob, do you want to give yourself a brief introduction? All right, I'll just jump right in here. Hi, everyone. It's glad to have uh, everybody here with us tonight. I'm just so happy to uh, be joined here by the A team and Dr. Allison Kurt. And so you have Dr. A and Dr. B here, one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. And it's great to see everyone. And uh, this is nice. I love these Zoom meetings. So it gets to be up close and personal. So tonight we're going to talk about creating uh, the fearless mindset and I've been studying the fearless mindset now for about 45 years as a player as a coach as an educator and I'm actually the resident sports psychologist with David Ledbetter at the World Teaching Headquarters at Champions Gate here in Orlando Florida and I've been doing this for a long time I started doing my first masters back in 1976 1977 I uh, went to the University of Virginia did my PhD with Bob Rotella and Linda Bunker and since then, it's just been, you know, a wonderful trip to find out how the mind affects performance because this six inch fairway, you know, between the ears, I mean, that's really where it begins and ends. It's the alpha and the omega for ultimate golf performance. So tonight, uh, just strap in and uh, if you want to ask some questions, you know, ask some questions because we're going to talk about creating a fearless mindset. So, all right, Dr. Ray, back to you. Okay, we're going to have a, a couple of slides up here just to sort of help articulate some points and get this loaded up. Hopefully everyone can see this. So the three topics that we're going to talk about in this very, very short period of time, you know, we only have 30 minutes to really give you the best of our minds in creating a fearless mindset. And first, we're going to start with a little bit of understanding of what is fear? How does it show up in the body? How does the brain respond? We'll certainly look at some definitions of doubt and worry and how that relates to confidence. And then our next session will be talking about how to build that mindset. What are some things that you can do to build the mindset for your golf game or just for your personal life? And then we're going to finish up with what is resiliency and acceptance? So this is another opportunity for you to really take in the fear and own it and overcome it. So that's going to be the areas that we'll discuss in our, our 30 minute presentation. So let's start off with fear. Let's start off with some definitions. What is it? How does that link to doubt, to worry, even anxiety that you may feel? And certainly confidence, sort of the flip side of what fear may be. So Dr. Bob, take us down this fear pathway. Well, let's just take a look at this picture. This is a wonderful example of fear waiting to happen or that it could happen. Here we have a young player, where, uh, Carson Stoller. He's a young player of mine. He plays for Hillsdale College. He plays for the Chargers. Great player. And this is at Sycamore Hills in Fort Wayne, Indiana. It's the 18th hole. 
And I want you to take a look at everything that's presented here. You have the golfer, you have his ball, he's looking at the target. And if we were really talking about playing fearless golf, nothing here in this picture would exist except the ball, the player, and the target, where he wants the ball to go. That's fearless golf. But so many of us play fearful golf. We're full of fear. We take a look at the water. We take a look at the bunker. We take a look at all the different places that we want to avoid missing. And we actually bring them to our full focus. We also look at the patio. We might see people up there. So we have social evaluation. We have this evaluation anxiety. So we have the fear of the hazards, the fear of the water. We have the fear of embarrassment, the fear of failure, the fear of losing our reputation. So. There's a lot of different things here in this picture. So what we're looking for is creating a mindset that works for you rather than against you. So let's take a look at fear and some of its cousins. The first thing I wanna take a look at is doubt. And doubt is a feeling of uncertainty, a lack of conviction. Many years ago, I had a great chance to spend some time with Tim Gowie. He is the author and he's the creator of the inner games, the inner game of golf, inner game of tennis, inner game of skiing. And he had a great equation as far as performance. He said, if your performance is directly equal to your potential, minus the interferences. Now, the greatest interference that I've found in my 40 years of being involved in sports psychology, applied sports psychology, is your own self-doubt. If we could actually eliminate the doubt, what would that leave us with? It would leave us with our potential. And no one can play over your potential. Your potential is always trying to be strengthened. But if you can play into that talent, you know, you're going to play pretty free golf. So doubt is something we're going to be talking about. And worry. Worry is this sort of little thing. It's allowing one's mind to dwell on difficulty or troubles. And there was a great researcher by the name of Dr. Edward Hollowell, who was a great researcher of worry and doubt. And he said that worry is simply an increase in feelings of vulnerability. I could get hurt, plus a decrease in a feeling of personal control. So when you're actually feeling more vulnerable, you're losing control. And a lot of us you know, feel that way when we're on the golf course. And so when we take a look at confidence, this is really where we're striving to become a state of feeling certain, a conviction that something will happen. And we're always trying to create that confident state. And I'm gonna talk about why people want to feel confident because by feeling confident, fear or doubt is not all that present. Now we always talk about, you know, can you have a little bit of fear and still be confident? Well, confidence allows you to get through the fear. And that's the whole point, is that not everyone who plays you know, golf is absolutely super bursting with confidence, but they are bursting with an action plan. So when we talk about fear, it's an unpleasant emotion caused by a belief that something unwelcoming will happen. And for most of us, the fear resides in our memory bank. It resides in the past. And so when I look at the word fear, I think about you know, when we were born, when we're babies, we only have two instinctual fears. We have the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. So we learn this fear. But when most of us learn to play golf, we didn't really you know, learn to play golf out of fear. In fact, the word fear is an acronym. When you're younger, it meant fun. It meant enjoyment. It meant anticipation of a reward. That's really what, you know, fear. It was a four-letter word, but it wasn't a bad four-letter word. So now, as we got you know, into competition or we wanted to get really good, fear became something very different. And fear for a lot of people, I've got a lot of acronyms, fear for a lot of people is a false expectation appearing real or a future event appearing risky. But for most people, they actually focus everything around results. And it's the consequences of the game that create a lot of fear. So we're gonna be taking a look at this fear, but I can tell you one reason right now why people love to be so confident. Because confidence is twofold. One, it's the belief that I can do something. When I step into a shot, I believe I can hit this shot. And real true self-confidence, a form of self-efficacy means I can hit this shot 
right now in this specific situation and produce a desired result. Now that's one part of this confidence you know, uh, concoction. The other half is I'm not afraid. I'm fearless. You know, I'm bulletproof. And that's why so many people love to feel confident because if you feel confident, you probably don't feel uncertain. You probably don't have that doubt. So that's really where we're trying to go with all of this. We're trying to replace the doubt, the worry, the fear, the trepidation, the anxiety, and we're trying to replace it with an action plan that can actually be you know, turned back into confidence. All right, Allison, there we go. That's a good place for you to jump in. That's a great place uh, to kickstart us. And there's a couple of key words that I want everyone to take a note of on this slide, is that when you look at fear and the flip side, confidence, they both are a belief. It's a state, which means that it's changeable. It doesn't say that it's a truth. It's actually what we believe in our brain, sort of our self schema. So looking at this picture, if we believe that we're gonna chunk this wedge shot into the water, the fear starts to rise up, it's just a belief. Consequently, this player could feel very confident that I've gotten over this water time and time again, so it's pretty easy for me to get over that water. So when you look at the fear that you experience on the golf course, look at it in terms of a, a belief and what sort of logic or stats do you have to support or dispel that belief? And so when I look at fear, I like to understand the anatomy of fear, like what's really happening in the brain. And so there's a really helpful brain model that I like to share with my students and my clients, and it's using our hand. So taking my hand and throwing in my finger, this is going to be my brain model. So my wrist going into my hand is going to be representative of a brain stem. And as I throw my thumb in, this is going to be a very important structure in here called the amygdala. And the amygdala is sort of that holder of where that fear comes from. It causes our fight, fight, flight, or fear responses. And as I close my hand over, this is our brain with our prefrontal cortex, which is right behind our eyes, and all of that wrinkly matter that we see in a typical brain. Well, what happens when we start to feel that fear and that belief, maybe we are having trouble getting over water or we're scared to hit the golf ball out of bounds. Our memories of past experiences are ignited and that amygdala is really on fire and it becomes overwhelmed to where literally we can't think straight and we flip our lid. And the logic that we would normally have in our brain to say, well, I could probably hit it down the middle, I could probably hit it over, it doesn't activate. And the amygdala is really overcoming the system and it becomes our fear response. So a lot of times people become paralyzed and they're not able to swing the golf club or they wanna run away from the golf course or they have difficulty creating a smooth motion in their golf swing. And so we wanna look at when the fear response is starting, notice heart rate beginning to increase, breathing rate starting to get faster, tension in our body. If you can identify the fear and you can understand it, then you're gonna be able to better contain it. So that leads us into a great place to move into how to build our mindset of a fearless mindset. And when we look at routines, that's a beautiful place for us to begin creating a fearless mindset is to have some routines in our golf game, some routines in our preparation so that we can combat that fear when it starts to come up. So Dr. Bob, we've got some great pictures here of you teaching pre-shot routines and mindset routines. So walk us through that. Well, I've got you know, a picture here down below. and I'm teaching all of our junior students at our Ledbetter Junior Golf Academy. I'm teaching them the thinking and acting model. And really, you'll see a lot of lines. You'll see like the yellow arrows. And what I'm doing here, I'm actually showing the separation between there's a time to think. If this is cerebral. A golf shot is so much about decision making, planning, uh, evaluating, and really coming up with a very purposeful decision. So there is a time to think and there is a time to act. That white line that you see there, that is called the trust line. It's also a line of commitment, a line of decision. So all of my uh, students, I don't care whether you have been at Brooks Kepka or Maria Fossi that you see here in this picture, you know, they all have learned how to get their thoughts, their feelings, and their emotions in order so they can make a purposeful 
and a solid decision long before they step in to aim and align themselves and actually go into the action phase of hitting a golf shot. So to me, so much about hitting a golf shot is really in the creation phase, is in the planning phase. And part of that planning phase, part of the thinking, and I want to go with what Dr. Allison was talking about, the amygdala, when we actually perceive some type of threat, now we've actually, through the homo sapiens, mankind, womankind, through many, many thousands of years, we've developed this reptilian mind. It's actually evolved into what we call the human mind, is that we have this um, amygdala hijacking. And what it does, it sends all the oxygen to the body through this stress response, through the fight, flight, or freeze response. And what happens, the logical brain, the prefrontal cortex that Dr. Kurt was talking about, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex doesn't really have the oxygen at that time. And that's why one of the things we want to do with our routine is to understand about deep breathing because the brain needs some oxygen so we can actually be clear headed. So people always talk about, is breathing a part of this routine? Absolutely. But when we have a routine, it's a part of what we call self-regulation. Because when you have a routine, and I was part you know, of this team and one of my great colleagues, great friends, Dr. Patrick Cohn from the University of Virginia, was really you know, the pioneer of the seminal work you know, of all these different routines, long routines, short routines, and then Bob Rotella and myself and several others started looking at routines. And one of the things that we know about routines is that routines are individual. They are like fingerprints. Not everyone has the same routine, but there are some very basic steps that are familiar for all routines. But the most important part of having a routine is that it gives you an action plan so that you can actually stay focused, stay purposeful, and have positive intent when you actually walk into the ball. Alex. So the components that I look at when building your own routine that's unique to you is to have a thought in the right place. So that would be sort of behind that line of trust as you see um, down in that below picture. And the thought could be um, where you wanna place the ball. Maybe it's a target orientation. Maybe it is a swing mechanic. Maybe it's just selecting the correct golf club. And then that thought is gonna lead you into an action. And that might be go ahead and taking in your breath, getting yourself nice and relaxed, walking into the golf ball. And then the third component of a, of a routine is gonna be that it's systematic, that you do it each and every time. You don't just choose it to do on your driver shot. You don't just choose it to, uh, to use it when you're full of anxiety. Do it each and every time. And that it's created for you it allows you to take that thinking brain and that emotional brain and organize them so that you feel safe, calm, collected to be able to hit your best shot. And the research on routines, whether it's in basketball, whether it's in batting and baseball, or in your routine for golf, shows that those that have a routine perform significantly better than those who just go up and wing it. And some of you may say, well, sometimes a routine takes too much time or it starts to slow down the group. Well, if you practice it, just like you practice your putting, you can start to get a great time of how long your routine takes. Maybe it only takes 13 seconds, 20 seconds. And as you start to cultivate what's the right time for you for your routine, you can build that into your process of hitting a shot. Now I say process because you'll see in one of the boxes here on the slide that we're looking at process focused versus outcome focused. So when you're building a routine and maybe that's including a practice swing, a deep breath, gauging yardage, and then walking in and executing the shot, you wanna be very mindful of each and every step that you're engaged in, the process of hitting the, the, the shot. If you're too focused on the outcome of where the ball might land, or what consequences the golf course holds for you, you'll get out of your routine, your brain is shifting to a different place that's literally blocking the signals that you wanna to send to your muscles to create a nice fluid swing. So we don't wanna put up that stop sign of those messages getting to the muscles, we want it to be free flowing. And when you engage in the process of your routine, it'll allow you to create smoother swings for better results. And the big key here is repeatability doing it time and time again. When you have a routine, like a morning routine, it sort of sets you off for a successful day. 
Well, if you have a routine for each and every shot, it could be a three foot putt to win your club championship or a three foot putt to win a $5 Nassau on the weekend. That routine will allow you to feel comfortable to be able to play your best. And that leads us into our next phase here, which is resiliency and acceptance, two major components of having a fearless mindset. So we understand fear, we know how routines can help us build that mindset. So what are we talking about when we look at resiliency and acceptance, Dr. Bob? Well, you know, we start talking so much about resiliency. It is the ability to bounce back, you know, from a bad shot. And then this whole notion about resiliency and acceptance, you know, acceptance is the last stage of a great one-shot mindset. And I'm gonna go on and go back here just a little bit here and what you said, Dr. Allison. I've got the word fear up here, F-E-A-R. And I would say almost for 99% of all people that have fear in their golf game, they focus everything around results. They're always outcome focused. You talked about being process focused. So we're gonna change that around to build a fearless mindset we need to focus on execution, execution of the task at hand. That's really what process golf's all about. And then if we focus on execution and do what we're supposed to be doing, and as we swing to our target with trust, we then can accept the result. And accepting the result is the last stage of any golf shot. So you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end to a routine. But that ending has to have the acceptance. And let's talk about what acceptance means. It's a recognition that something is what it is. It's done. It's a done deal. There also has to be a tolerance. You don't have to like, you know, your result. You don't have to. A lot of people say, well, what if I hit it in the water? You know, am I supposed to laugh it off? I'm not saying that. But it has to be accepted. It is, you know, a done deal. So there is a certain tolerance to that. So acceptance means I'm gonna put closure on this shot. Now, when I put closure on this shot, I can release it and move on and be starting my next shot with renewed vigor and enthusiasm. I mean, that's just a huge thing for all of us here because most of us don't play with a lot of acceptance. A lot of us take our trash from shot to shot. And having a great routine the final stage for any good one-shot mindset is that you have to be able to accept what you've already done and maybe even learn you know, from it because everything about the routine is to create movement confidence and movement trust. So when we start talking about being resilient, start being accepting, you know, these are very key you know, ingredients of having a great routine. So when we start talking about that, we're also talking about creating grit. Uh, this relentless mindset, this enduring mindset, this tenacious mindset. And explain a little bit more what we might mean by that grit mentality, Allison. Yeah, I've gotten really attracted to this term grit, um, reading a, a fabulous book by a psychologist named Angela Duckworth, who did a lot of uh, scaling of grit and formulating how you can test somebody on what their grit factor is. And it's really this strength of character to keep persevering when things are challenging. So that kind of leads us into a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. So the difference between that is someone who has a, a fixed mindset, when they come up to the 13th hole and the last five rounds, they've put that golf ball in the water, they assume that that's going to happen again. There's a challenge that they're faced with, a very difficult hole based on their experience, and they just accept the fact that it's gonna keep going in a negative way. Where a growth mindset person would say, you know, the past five rounds I've hit it in the water, but there's a good opportunity for me to get it over today. Why is today? Because I'm gonna accept this challenge and I'm really going to be present, use my new pre-shot routine or routine to get me set, and I'm gonna be curious about the outcome. Wherever it may go, I'm just going to be curious to see where it goes. And that mindset shifts us into a place of acceptance, which also helps us bounce back from when things are challenging. Because we all know what it feels like to have a double bogey and then have to come back that next hole to see if we can just grab a par to get the train rolling in the right direction. 
How do you ba bounce back when things start to go um, off, off track? Well, we look at grit. And are you gritty? Are you able to come back from that double bogey and say, you know what, let's regroup, let's take, take a deep breath, let's clear out all the negative thoughts from my body and let's start fresh. Do you use any mental strategies like marking a little line on your scorecard to say, stop. That double bogey is where it stops. I'm gonna end the bleeding. I'm going to start over. Um, do you look at things that are challenging, like having to hit a little cut shot through the trees as a cool and neat opportunity to learn? Or do you walk into that situation and say, oh gosh, here we go again. That would be more of a fixed mindset. So opening up your brain, opening up your body, to look at these challenges as something fun, something cool, something for you to persevere, gives you a high level of grit factor. For those of you that look at those challenges and say, oh, the ball's in a divot, it's not gonna go the way I want it to, that's gonna be low grit factor. So if you can improve your grit factor and really allow, you, allow yourself to be accepted of the challenges, provided that they're within your window of tolerance, window of tolerance means it's within this, the scope that I feel like I can keep things together. If it gets outside of that scope, maybe I need more education to feel confident, maybe I need more coaching to feel confident. If it's in your window of tolerance, then be curious and open to see what possibilities there are. And I think that's really what is one of the key defining factors of a fearless mindset. Those that are fearless, and we look at some of the best players out on tour who, when we look at fear, they really associate that with. Tiger Woods would be one of them. They look at challenges as a neat opportunity to excel. They don't look at challenges as being a bummer, um, a scorecard killer, or adding more strokes to, to the end result. They look at it as a fun challenge. And so when, when I ask you to kind of examine and reflect back on how gritty are you on the golf course, um, do, do a little inventory and, and ask yourself, when you get into some challenging situations, how do you respond? Are you responsive with like, cool, I think I can go ahead and get this? Or are you more in the fixed mindset of like, mm, here we go again, I know I'm just going to double bogey it. <laughs> yeah, Allison, let me just jump right in there. I've always you know, told myself, you've got to be smarter than your doubt and you know, better than your fear. And what that means is, and let's not, you know, just BS anybody here. It's tough. I mean, this is a tough game. And it's a, you know, uh, it's a cruel game, really. It breaks your heart. And I know I've had my heart broken many times over these many 45 years playing the game, as all have all of us here. But the point of it is, is that smarter than your doubt, the doubt will always be around us. You know, we always have these little thoughts because every day we have 66,000 thoughts. And here's a fact, is that about two thirds of those thoughts are negative limiting facts or, or thoughts. What I'm trying to say here is that even as little toddlers, we're told no about 400 times a day. We hear no, don't go here, don't go there. So what we have to understand is we cannot be afraid of the doubt. We've got to be better than our fear. For example, say that you aren't very competent and confident on a 40 to 50 yard little wedge shot you know, into the green where a lot of people have problems. The closer they get to the green, they get tight. The one thing that you're gonna to have to do, you're gonna to have to train yourself to be comfortable moving through the uncomfortableness. Because when we have fear, it hits us immediately. It hits us like you know nausea. We know a mistake is coming up. Why? Because we're not in the present moment. We're actually reflecting back into the past and hoping that it doesn't happen again in the future. So the main thing is to get a hold of your mind and say, this is what's important now. That's how we win, that's W-I-N, what's important now. And it's important that we stay in the present moment and actually, once we actually start executing our process, that sort of insulates us from the doubt and the worry. Because if we are really task focused and when target engaged, you know, really fear and doubt doesn't really entertain ourselves anymore. So the more that we actually get into the shots, the more that we actually stay in the moment, the more that we can create this fearless mindset. I love all the acronyms that you use. I think we need to like jot these down and share them with my students because you've got some really awesome acronyms. 
Um, to kind of wrap everything up, I invite everybody as a little bit of a homework for you is to do a fear inventory. Write down what are all the things that really scare you on the golf course? What are the situations that you get into that you notice your fear response reacting? And then from there, I invite you to go face them. Go put yourself in those situations on the golf course. So if it is that 30 to 40 yard pitch shot over water, find a time on the golf course where it's a little bit quiet that you can take a bucket of balls out there and face your fear and get yourself in that situation to overcome it so that you can override some of the old memories in your brain telling you that you aren't confident when you get into that situation. Create some new memories in a very calm and neutral state to showcase that you can um, be able to overcome those fears. So this is just a little sample of some elements of how you can create a fearless mindset. Of course, in 30 minutes, you're not able to create um, the most mentally perfect mind ever, but you can continue working on it with both Dr. Bob and myself. So I've had some contact information for us there and also our websites. So what I'd like to do now is we've got a few moments left and if there's any questions, I invite you to just chat them in the box and I'll be happy um, to facilitate those and Dr. Bob and I will, will answer those. And I think a lot of the players that I talk with tend to have a lot of fear on the first hole. And as they get with a new group, someone that they haven't played golf with before, maybe they're in a tournament, they get those first T fear jitters. Dr. Bob, what is sort of your golden nugget for that player who struggles with that? Well, that's the first thing. I want to make sure that once they step to the first tee, they're ready to play golf because so many of us warm up. We go to the driving range. We really don't have a very adequate warm up, even if we warm up at all. And then we step to the first tee and we start thinking, oh my gosh, everybody's looking at me. I really love for everybody to do this one time is that step up, put your tee ball on the tee, and then step up and look around. Are there people really looking at you? No one really cares what you do on the tee. All they want you to do is get you know, the heck off the, you know, the stage, all right? No one really cares. That's the first thing. So the first thing I always tell my players, it's about you, your ball, and your target. And that's it. So get your focus into doing what you need to be doing. But something that Jack Nicklaus told me one time, he said, the one thing on the first tee that I've always done, I've always taken a little bit more time. I'm a little bit more deliberate. I walk a little bit slower. But even in my rehearsal swings, I make a really full and complete swing. Because on the first tee, we tend to get fast. We tend to get short. We tend to get tight. And then, you know, the hands you know, start to overturn. You know, our legs stop. And then we actually hit that big snipe hook. So make a really big rehearsal swing. Then as you, you know, step, get ready to step in the ball, take a nice you know, moment. Just say to yourself, this is my day. You know, tell yourself, this is my day, this is my time, let's step in. And when you step in, keep your focus on the target and swing through the ball to your target. Those three words right there, we live in a three word society. I love you, Coke is it, you know, swing to the target, all right? To the target. I've always loved that, you know, saying. So when you step into the ball, where do you want the ball to go? To the target. You're always swinging to the target versus some other type of doubt or fear-ridden word, all right? So that's really what I tell people is just to kind of slow it down, make a smooth swing, but also prehearse. Really actually overstretch yourself so you can make a full turn and give yourself good rhythm and good timing so you can hit the ball solidly. Great. We've got four questions in here that we'll go through real quick. How do you advise your clients when they're inconsistent? This player struggles with driving the ball going every direction and lose, loses confidence. And so number one, if we're inconsistent, um, we have to look at our mechanics. And so potentially our mechanics are not competent enough. They haven't been built skillfully enough to create a repeatable um, strike on the golf ball. But on the flip side, as humans, we are inconsistent. We aren't robots. We don't do the exact same thing every day. And every day our state is a little bit different. Our mood is a little bit different. That means our swing is a little bit different. 
And so I would invite you to actually be accepting of the golf ball moving different directions. If it fades one day and draws the next day, that's okay. If it's outside of your window of tolerance and it's out of bounds or in the water, then we wanna look at improving some of the mechanics so that your confidence can be built. Dr. Bob, do you have a response to that? I think it is. Most people I play with and have coached have been unbelievably consistent. Consistently inconsistent. That means every <laughs> time they did, they stepped into the shot and they did something different every time. Wouldn't it be great if you stepped into the ball and you had a consistent thought pattern, a consistent routine, and you had a consistent way to say, this is what I want to do. So whether you have, you know, the motor movement skills, you know, developed yet, that's one thing. But to have a mind that says, this is what I want to do, you can develop and train a consistent mindset. And that to me would be, you know, the, the first place I would be looking at. Perfect. Um, so this is kind of on the flip side. Instead of when things go bad, what do we do? How about when things go really well? So let's say you've just made four or five birdies in a row and all of a sudden you tank it with a double bogey. Um, so how I coach my players is that to me is an awareness of the outcome and it's getting out of the process. So if you've just made three or four birdies in a row and things are going really well, your attention might be drawn to foreshadowing what might happen to my round if I keep doing this? If your brain goes into future storytelling, where your brain is not is in the moment, in the process. So if you have an awareness of things are going really well, I'm playing one of my best rounds, get back in track of focusing on the process. Notice the ground underneath your feet, notice the grip in your hands, get away from thinking about the score and get back into the moment so that you complete your round. Any thoughts? For me, yeah, I have a great thought. It's, uh, everyone's very passionate about golf and passionate about food. I always talk about the shrimp cocktail bowl at parties. Uh, I will go and I will grab a couple of shrimp cocktail. If I'm having a great round of golf, I'm always thinking about, let's go, let's have another shrimp cocktail, let's have another shrimp cocktail. If I make a bogey or make a double bogey, I drop my shrimp. I sit there, I'm not going to sit here and cry about it. I'm going to go back, you know, to the shrimp cocktail bowl and get myself some more shrimp cocktail. What this means is I'm going to trust that I, I've been playing pretty well all day, you know, by going one after one after one until I'm done. Okay, so I, I've actually, you know, dropped a couple of shots, dropped a couple of my shrimp cocktail, but I'm going to go back to what I know has been working for me all day. That's confirmation that my process is working. So that's really how I, I sort of view it. Great. Well, we have one more before our time is up, and this is a great one. Someone in here has a couple of students who are on the call, and we're looking at how to take mechanics from the range to the golf course. And I love this conversation. I love this topic because it's so relevant to all of us. We've just finished taking a lesson, and maybe we're working on pressure shift and how to rotate and the sequence and the timing. And then we go to the golf course, and we're still in that mindset of thinking, and we're not performing. So what I like to do on the range is create scenarios that are golf course like. So after I've moved through my mechanics on the range, I might play a few holes on the range, or I might go through my pre-shot routine and get the timing exactly how my timing is on the golf course and hit different shots. I might walk away for 30 seconds, pull a new golf club, and then get more target oriented. Um, a great colleague of mine once said, when you think, you stink. So once we're out of our mechanics, we need to get more into the doing, the execution of things rather than am I in the right position here and there and make that happen on the range, create more golf course like settings on the range so that you can practice that transference before you head onto the golf course. Do you have any golden nuggets to finish this off with today? Well, I'll tell you, I, I love exactly what everything you said, you know, Alice, I, I, I agree with 100%. But I would even add, you know, one caveat to that. You know, last five balls before you actually go play, take five balls. These are what we call our trust balls. You take a driver and say maybe you take a target that's down the left-hand side with full intention and conviction. You step into that shot, you make it as real as you possibly can, and you swing with trust to that target. Now you take your second ball, 
total trust, full routine to a right target. You're going to a different visual alignment. This is why we talk about variability of targets. And you actually take a five iron and you go to that target and you do it again and again and again, five balls. Five balls, total intention, total sense of purposefulness. How trusting can you be? How much can you really let go of the over-controlling tendencies and really fall in love with your target? Because let's face it, golf is a target game and you've got to actually swing to your target. If you fall in love with your target, it's amazing that that ball usually finds what you're really focused upon. So I would do that little five ball drill in addition to everything that you just said. Fantastic. Well, great words to end on. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Bob. It's always great collaborating with you and putting together some great content for all of our participants. And hopefully everyone tonight was able to pick a couple of things on how to build their fearless mindset. Again, if you'd like the recording, uh, feel free to email me or if you just wait a couple of days, we'll both have it up on our YouTube channel. So you're welcome to watch it there. Thanks so much for participating. Any questions, feel free to reach out to us and we'll see you all soon. Take care, Dr. Bob. Big hug for everybody here. Great hug. Great job. See you soon. Okay. Bye.